Well, hello. Hi, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have to like legally state like what you do on like when you call Sprint? Not to you guys. <laughs> I am above the law. Yeah, well, you guys are going to stand for the whole interview? How's this? Oh, yeah, standing's good for your health. Sitting's like worse than bacon. Uh. I'm wearing a muumuu for you. Liz is my counterpart of loving muumuu. I see that. Do I have your legal permission to record? <laughs> yeah, no, it's just you. <laughs> wow, yeah. this looks so yeah. dumb. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the way it's like in your ear, it's like that. <laughs> This is what marriage is, folks. Yeah. One set of headphones and two bodies. Okay, so do I have your legal permission to record everything that we have been recording thus far and going forward? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to introduce two of my favorite people in the world, one of my favorite couples, Ben and Liz Bohannon. Oh, um, stop, stop it, stop it. But before we jump in... Uh, we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about work. Uh, but one of the things that just popped into my head as I was looking at myself before this call, um, that has caused paranoia in me now is that Liz just told me, and Ben, I want your commentary on what this looks like in the morning. Liz told me that when she wakes up, her eyebrows are like animals in and of themselves. And that the first thing she does in the morning is go like this. Is that true? So it has been true in the past, um, but Liz is actually, uh, her tool belt has grown. Ooh. So now the first thing she does is roll over and get her eyebrow pin out. Eyebrow wax. Wax. Eyebrow wax pin. Because This spit, is real? Spit doesn't hold for long enough. Is that, see this? That's a quick fix. <laughs> I got a... I In got a, a pinch. Wax, I got a wax crayon. Crayon. Wax. That. Crayon on my eyebrows. Wow, that Which is so would be best. I don't even have eyebrows, so she's yeah. holding it down for the whole marriage. Yeah, I have eyebrows. This is a picture. I have of, eyebrows for two. This is a picture of partnership. <laughs> Careful. I see the thing is, I don't think I was ever paranoid about my eyebrows until you said that. And then like right before we started this, I saw like that one was like down like mm. this and there was a big gap. And this is Joy, now, you would you would know if you needed it to be paranoid. Joy, it's have my you whole ever... life when I was born, they were like, Oh my gosh, a baby girl came with these eyebrows. You would know. You'd be hearing it for all. So they life. really just like from you sleep so violently that in the morning they're just like every which way. And my eyebrows are just really intense. They have wills of their own. <laughs> they have wills of their own. <laughs> that is so good. Well, that's a beautiful picture of marriage. Uh, does Ben wake up with anything out of sorts? <laughs> no, this is no, how I wake up with nothing all the time. This is how Ben wakes up. Ben goes from like. I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping to like, hello world. <laughs> and then he's just like awake. That's no, a, a, no, no transition time for Ben. Why waste Not time? even a little bit. Why that waste time getting the day started? E yeah, I mean, really even is. sans coffee, you're that way. Even without coffee, you're that way. Mm. Did you hear me? Did we freeze? Yep. Oh. Sorry, we oh. lost you. But yeah, yes, yeah, sans coffee. Yeah. Yep, yeah. we're good. So do yeah. you just drink coffee for the sheer joy of it, not because you need it? No, but like after an hour, I'm ready for a nap. So the coffee's <laughs> good. It keeps me going. That's great. Yeah. Well, this has been Marriage with Liz and Ben Bohannon. Uh, <clears throat> no, okay. Ting. Um, currently, you guys are in your office um, because mm -hmm. you work together. And yes. I just interviewed another couple who um, they are creative. Uh, he's a DJ. She is a spoken word poet. And mm -hmm. they are married, but they've always done their own separate things. And now they are collaborating and they're doing an album together. And so I was just thinking how it's fun to interview because my parents, they do love and respect. And they obviously are on the road together and working together all the time. And there's obviously tensions that happen with that um, because it's not just marriage. It's marriage and work. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about it like in terms of even just like work styles compared to like you go from single you're doing your own thing and then you're married and now you're you are one and so with work styles you actually have the added like you're two individual people and your work is married as well so I want to talk about that later so just start thinking about that in your head and pre-plan uh, answers <clears throat> for my questions or deep thoughts but first I want people to know how you guys met mm. well Dang, and I want it, I want al alternating okay. sentences. <laughs> okay. One time I wore a trucker hat. 
<laughs> that's all there is to know. That's the, that's the whole story. That's what I've been doing wrong. The night, the night Ben met me, the night Ben met me, I had braided pigtails and a trucker hat a John Deere with a trucker puffy hat. vest on. That was night one. Wait, was this and the night that thought, you guys had that dance party that I've seen pictures from, or is that when you guys fell in love? Yeah, that was kind of when the magic started happening. Oh. So I need a trucker can, hat and a dance party. Yeah, Liz yeah. has had the trucker hat on often. Trucker hat and braided pigtails. Yeah. That makes you the weirdo for <laughs> being into it. <laughs> No, but you guys had been friends for a while. You both led, uh, you were working with Young Life. This was in college at yeah, Ms. Yeah. U, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. The, yeah. that's what the cool kids call it. That, is that Missouri University? Yeah. Uh, it's actually the University, University of Missouri. Missouri. Mizzou, close. not Ms. U. Ms. U. Why? Mizzou. Mizzou. Come on. But Missouri yeah. is with S's, not Z's. Mm. Well, oh my gosh! So, somebody call them. So when it's written, so when it's written out, how do you write it? M I Z Z O U. M I Z Z O U. M I Z. Come on, Joy. It's so, a brand. So it's you're frozen. <clears throat> you guys were frozen as in well. your face. <laughs> oh come on. We might need. Why don't you go get your charger? Okay, we're back. No, it does keep freezing. But anyways, um, yeah, that seems really messed up because that's not how you spell Missouri. So these kids are getting illogical teaching just it's from the get-go. It's important. <sighs> I don't know about that. Um, okay, so, so you, yeah, we met him as you doing Young Life together. Okay. And then, and you, then Ben manipulated me into marrying him with his <laughs> head leader powers. This is a great story. <laughs> it's an uplifting story, story of marriage and partnership. No, you guys. You guys had ups and downs. You broke up. Liz, you freaked out, right? And then, Ben, you were, like, in Australia, and then you wrote her all these letters. Tell us a little bit yeah, about I mean, that, Ben. So Why did, did you stick it out? Well, mm. I'd say this. So the trucker hat? Liz and I, Liz and I did not have um, the easiest dating. We were great friends for a long time. So we were great friends for, like, four years, three <clears> years. <throat> um, so we respected each other a lot. We led Young Life together, had a ton of fun together, had a lot of friends in, in – um, uh, in common. So when we started dating, though, Liz had um, recently gotten out of, of a very long relationship. Mm -hmm. And I had... 14 um, years. She was six. <laughs> yeah, she, she started young. She knew what commitment yeah. was. But, uh, Welcome to Missouri. No, it was seven years, though. Uh, was, and I had gotten out of a relationship as well. And um, I felt like I basically spent the first probably seven months talking Liz into actually still <laughs> dating me almost every time we hung out. Like what She's would you, what would she say? I mean, <laughs> there was, there was a logic that here was the interesting thing. Liz often thought she was breaking up with me, but she just forgot to communicate that <laughs> to me. So there would be actual moments where at the end of the night, she thought we had broken up. But I walked away from it being like, "That was a great night." You know, it was hard. It was a you know we had a hard conversation, but we're and, gonna and hang meanwhile, out I'm like, man, he took that so well. <laughs> yeah. He made so, plans to go see a movie tomorrow night. <laughs> so for someone who's not afraid of conflict, which is Liz, um, apparently messaging can be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, but mm -hmm. we we dated for for six or seven months before I left the country and I was getting ready to leave the country and I was going to go to Australia for like six months after college with some of my best friends. And, um, Liz did go through with the breakup at that point. Um, I, it was clear. Well, the first night was not clear. <laughs> I'll just say this and you can edit this off the camera or not, but we had a great makeout session after we allegedly <laughs> broke up. Who the heck does that? And Liz you know, thought I was, I'm like, this rules. I just broke up with him and he still wants to make out. <laughs> because he doesn't know we broke up. Right. I didn't realize there's that some, until later. There's some clear issues going on there. But then we did eventually um, officially break up. Still somewhat confusing because I'm like, <laughs> the, the context of it felt like, hey, you're going to go to Australia and we should break up. And then maybe we'll get back together when we, you get back. And I didn't. Again, there was a lot of miscommunication happening because Liz didn't necessarily think that I, I'm not, I believe now, but at that time I was like, 
seems like you want to break up while we're gone and then maybe get back together. And my heart's really broken in this. She was very surprised that I actually cried when we broke, when we officially broke up. Mm -hmm. Somehow it wasn't going to hurt at all. Uh, Wait, but my, my question for you, Ben, insert, I don't want you to lose track, but one of the things that bugs me about movies is (laughs) that like a lot of times the female role will play this like hard to get like, oh, fight for me, fight for me. Like that wasn't your intention, Liz, but that is kind of what you were doing. And why did you keep going after it? Like, what was it? Is is it that men just like love this chase or something? Or was there just something about her that you knew this was more from her past relationship or whatever? She's just a really bad communicator. (laughs) I mean, for me, it was always the eyebrows. (laughs) Who can like this? Someday I will help her keep those camped. Um, no, I mean, I, I felt like they're the, again, like the fact that Liz and I had such a strong friendship from the beginning, um, like I knew, I knew all the good stuff about her. Like I knew how bright she was. I knew how fun she was to be around, like how passionate she was. And I, like, I felt like there was something in her that like I wanted to fight for and unlock and, um, it was worth it. So I don't know. It was a maddening year. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then where, when did these letters happen? Because I remember her telling me that there were like letters that you wrote and some that have never actually been found, right? Yeah, right. There well, some lost in the universe. When we were, this was still in like Ben's talking Liz into Oh, yeah, so her, we hadn't broken up yet. She was bit, um, for the real time. This is like at the beginning of our dating relationship. She was going to go to Europe. Um, for like three weeks with her sister and to find myself I was like hey this would be fun to like write her some some love notes so I got I like was like the overprotective boyfriend I was like hey I need to know everywhere you're going and where you're going to be staying and she's like you're not Uh, my boyfriend (laughs) and you're like I don't hear you (laughs) so then I wrote her all these letters and sent them to like all the hostels that she was going to be staying at along the way Um, only like one of them arrived (laughs) but so we don't really know. Maybe I did only write one and I've always told her I wrote like 20. True, but. true. Or there's, you know how like at hostels they have like the book exchange where you can like leave books, take books, you know, like tucked in the books. There's this letter that people just come and they read to feel like they're loved. You're really doing the world a service, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the first letter that I got, we were staying at a hostel in like, I think we were in Florence and the hostel guy owner, he was like 50, but he was kind of a weirdo. And I kind of got like a weird vibe from him. And so we went out that night. And then when I came home that night on my bed, on a pillow, there was a letter that said Elizabeth on the front of it. And I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I was like, lock your doors. Lock your doors. <laughs> it was not a love letter from the hostel owner. <laughs> I love that. That's what you assume. That's so great. Um, okay. So then, well, obviously, I know details about your love story because I'm so obsessed with you guys as a couple that I kind of graft myself in, in a way. Um, but for those of who, do, who don't know, what was it about Ben that ultimately you knew you wanted to partner with for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> Besides his non-eyebrows brows. <laughs> Besides his ghost brows. Um, <clears throat> no, to be serious, I think the biggest thing is literally from the day that I met Ben, I definitely didn't want to date him. I was like, whoa, that guy's kind of intense. He'd have to marry a really interesting, special human. But I had a, I had an immense, tremendous amount of respect for him. So we were in ministry together. He was leading Young Life. The way that he, the intentionality that he had with the men in his life, both his like guy friends and the high school boys he was doing ministry with and just like was totally all in and really committed to it. And he was, he's very naturally gifted as a leader. And I feel like even when I wasn't romantically attracted to him, I saw those qualities and he felt like this kind of like force in the room in a really good way, in the sense of like, I wouldn't be the most important thing in this guy's life. Like there's other things that he cares about and Mm -hmm. would push me on and challenge me on. And that was really attractive to me. Well, it wasn't attractive in the sense that I want to date you attractive, but (laughs) I really respected him a lot from the beginning. Wouldn't you tell your ex-boyfriend uh, like this guy is like when you say things about Ben to your ex, 
Oh, yeah. Didn't Ooh, he? I would not have done that if I knew I would end up marrying. Which, I, yeah, I think that's proof that you didn't you didn't know that because you also would totally. have your ex-boyfriend stay like, with Ben, like, right? Like ben would naturally come up in conversation with my boyfriend, who I loved a lot and totally thought we were going to get married. All right. Let's get back to it. So let's just repeat that. So the things that you loved about Ben, you just saw... Hello. You saw like what? It, <laughs> now you guys just hold still, and I think it froze. <laughs> Anyways, long uh, story short, you think Ben's great. Uh, you talk about him to your ex boyfriend. You have your ex boyfriend stay with him when he comes to visit, which really shows that you didn't think thing. You really had a friendship with Ben. True. But circumstances change. He wrote you letters. He won you over. Ultimately, what? Wait. Then what changed your mind? What was the point? Ooh, what was the point? <clears throat> well, I spent weeks wandering through the hillside in Switzerland oh. trying to find my, myself. I really did at one point. I really, really, really did think I was in love with two people. It was very sad and dramatic and angsty. Yeah. And I uh, I did actually play out this one scenario where I was like, Had okay. Two husbands. Yeah, brother, <laughs> brother husbands. <laughs> So I played out this scenario. I ran it by both of them. Ben was the only one on board. So I just ended up with him. And then TLC called us. So we're <laughs> excited to announce our new show, Brother Husbands. Awesome. I love it. No, I did one of my scenarios because I like to do hypotheticals. So I would be like hiking and I'm like thinking about these things. And I would literally be like, you're in a terrible accident. You're a paraplegic and fat, half your face is gone. And the left side of your tongue is paralyzed. Who would you rather be married to? So I kind of kept playing out these circumstances, and <clears throat> I kept thinking that I would rather be married to Ben. So, and I knew Ben I had a thing for paraplegics. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. no, I think I knew. I think it was for me. It was just it was like a fear thing. It was letting go of this thing that I had had that I was genuinely really blessed by that I felt really safe and comfortable in and like the fear of letting that go and making a huge mistake and ruining something for something that was way more unknown. Mm. Cause I didn't know, you know, it was like, I knew that I respected Ben. Like I knew that as a person, I really admired him and loved him, but I had no idea if the two of us would work together. And it was like, but to, to explore that meant completely letting go and potentially ruining this other thing. And so yeah. it, was, it was really scary. So it ultimately just came down to my my desire to know like what that other thing could be mm -hmm. out outweighed the fear of letting this other thing go. Yeah. And then when I broke up with him, like the day afterwards, I was like, "This is dumb." <laughs> yeah. right, but it was fine broke. for him because he never oh, thought you yeah. guys had broken up, so it was good. Yeah. <laughs> so Australia, and I was like, I got a girlfriend back in the U.S. <laughs> Just called me in a while, but like, I know she's thinking of me. Oh, I love so it. I asked, I asked him back out very formally. I asked him out over video Skype to be my boyfriend. So I will say that if it weren't for me asking Ben to date me, that we wouldn't be married. I'm just, all I'm telling you now, I'm letting you in on the little secret, is that when you ask Ben that over Skype, he's thinking, I'm going to play along right now, but I didn't know that we weren't together. <laughs> he's like, okay? This seems like a game. Are we doing a role-playing game? I'm not sure <laughs> is this one of your scenarios, Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> no, he did because he cried too. And then I was like staring at him in the video chat and it was very sweet. But it's kind of interesting watching someone cry in video chat because you can't like, you're like, oh. Especially okay. when it keeps freezing, like our interview freezes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that didn't happen. I never cried. Not no. true. Mm -mm, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well now you guys are together forever and you took a big risk on this relationship. It worked out and you've taken another risk. Um, which is starting your company, Seiko Designs, and then Ben took a risk and said yes to starting it with you. So um, talk to us about, tell people what Seiko Designs is, and then let's get into what it's like to work together. Yeah. So the long story short is that Seiko is an ethical fashion brand. We're based in East Africa, and we make beautiful products. 
that help um, girls continue their education and go on to university. So I originally very first started Seiko when I was living in Uganda. I moved there right after I graduated from college and then came back home to the States and we launched it. Um, we launched it here together. I love it. And um, it started out as shoes, but now you have, yep. or sandals, but now you have shoes yep. and purses. As and of scars. yesterday. What, what? Uh, what's the, is there a name for the fall line? The fall collection. <laughs> yeah. Fall collection. And what, what I, I'm really getting at is that what did you name after me? Because I'm still waiting for Joy Jangle's purse to come out. Spring 2019, baby. All right. It's on the docket. <laughs> Um, and so Ben, how did you, obviously this wasn't what you, what was your major? Uh, uh, I did business and religious studies. Okay. And I thought, I mean, my plan was to go into kind of some kind of full-time ministry, whether that was through Young Life, go to seminary, um, work at a church. And, but after my time in Australia, I decided to come back and, um, ended up getting a job at a consulting company. I worked, um, I was at a tech consulting company and, um, did not miss necessarily plan on selling women's shoes and purses for a living. Um, but that's what we do now. And what are your, like, what are your two roles and how much do you guys intermix? Yeah. Well, the longer we go, the more and more separate, like in the very beginning, we obviously both had kind of our focuses, but it was really like, there's only two of us. So we, it was very overlapping. The bigger we grow and more people we bring on our team, I would say the less and less our actual roles start to overlap. Well, the more distinct they are, mm -hmm. but we still have like a slice that I think the two of us are always in all the time. So my role is I do all of our product development and design. So what we're going to sell, what it's going to look like, designing it, all the on the ground partnerships. So going over to Africa, figuring out who's going to make it, where we're going to source the materials, doing kind of setting up production and all of our production partnerships. And then a lot of our kind of branding, voice, marketing side over here in the U.S. Um, and then Ben? Yeah, so I, I run all of our um, essentially sales channels. So a wholesale channel, um, building out kind of our sales team and kind of setting some of the strategy there. And then online strategy, um, kind of some of our like um, e-commerce tech kind of strategy. And then um, overall finance, accounting, numbers. Anything in, in Excel that Liz doesn't want to do. I hate Excel. Okay, so I know you have you full time employ around sixty women in Africa, or is it all women? Mm -hmm. And Mostly. then and then you have how? If is it forty eight uh, girls who have gone through your education program? They work for 47. nine months. Forty seven. Okay. Yeah. Um, because and tell the reason for that. Because of how things are set up, why you set oh, it up that way. I'm yeah. So in Uganda, there's a gap. There's a nine-month gap in between high school and university. So it's intended to allow students that can test into college to find time, to find a job, to make money, to pay for college. The group that we're working with, the organization that we're working with, recruits really academically gifted young women who have a ton of leadership potential, but they come from backgrounds of extreme poverty. So when I was living in Uganda, one of the things that was kind of happening while I was there is there was this bigger and bigger growing issue that these girls were graduating from the secondary school, they're testing into college, super bright, had all of this you know, gumption and excitement about what they were gonna do and go to university and become leaders in their communities, and then they're going back home to their villages and it just kind of all fell apart because they couldn't find jobs and, and there wasn't any social support there. for them to continue. You have to go to school with money. Loans. Yeah. Yeah. You have to pay up front <clears throat> with cash or you're not going. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I started this basically as a way to two things. One, so that they can earn money doing something where they could actually get paid so that they could earn money towards university. And two, something to really keep them together living in community with like minded women who mm -hmm. are kind of pushing each other towards the next step. Because when they go back to their villages, they face a ton of social pressure to get married, to start having kids. A lot of them are from areas of the country where the dowry system is still in place, so their families are super financially motivated to get them married off. Yeah. Um, so it's twofold. One is the money, and two is kind of the community aspect. Yeah. Um, and do you feel like now that the communities are seeing these girls go off to college, that they're outside of just these young girls, that the community mindset is starting to shift at all? Yeah, I really – I mean, I think that the, the longer this goes on and the more women – think, you know, it's like so much of 
the world is just so fear-based, right? And mm-hmm. so until you see another possibility and see something being lived out, you can live in this place of like, oh, the fear of like what that means or what's going to happen, you know, to our family. And I think our women are continuing on and their families are starting to see that when they're educated and when they're empowered and when they know how to open a bank account and how to take care of themselves and how to manage their money and how to pursue their different goals in the community that ultimately that's not just benefiting her, that's benefiting their entire families. Yeah. So we have seen both on, you know, with kind of larger family structures and societal structures, but also just on a small individual basis with women who are married or who have little sisters getting to see that up close and personal of like, Oh my gosh, this is what happened when my sister took that next step. Like, I want to do that. Like, that's awesome. And I see how that's actually affecting me and my family really positively. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So then you travel over to Africa multiple times a year. What? Did I miss something? Are you guys, are you guys having a little side conversation? Hey, do what you have to do. Um, <laughs> So you travel over to Africa multiple times a year to see yeah. the production, to visit the women, to look for where you're going to be sourcing your next, you know, leather or whatever it is that you're using. Um, so then you're yeah. gone for long stints. You also speak all over. You're one of the best speakers I've ever heard. And I, you know, I don't say that lightly. Uh, get me a free pair of sandals, whatever. Um, and (laughs) no, but so then how does that affect, how does that affect your marriage? Because I think maybe Mm -hmm. with the last couple, it's like they, they were talking about how, you know, when they would work on their music, he would lock himself in a room. He had a process. She would lock herself in another room. And so now for them to collaborate, they're in the room together. And that's the way that it's like, they couldn't bring Mm -hmm. their two separate pieces. They actually have to work together. But the issue, and that's yeah. what they had to overcome. You guys are now overcoming the fact that even though you work together, you're apart for really long stints. And that has yeah. to yep. create uh, individual, you know, kind of patterns and you get used to doing things on your own. And then what happens when you come back together? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. When um, the first time Liz went to Uganda for a long stint was maybe like six months after we had been married. And she went to Uganda for five or six weeks um, and we were still living in Kansas City at the time. Mm-hmm. And that's where I had lived before we got married. All my roommates lived down the street from, like my ex-roommates, um, all single guys lived down the street from us. So it was super easy for me at that point. Um, like I, we didn't really have like the culture of marriage set up mm-hmm. um, in a strong enough way that like my identity, identity was still kind of in that single space. Um, so it was really easy for me. He was a swing player. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> Day. It was just so easy for me. Hey, to like, sports reference. Was, High five. Yeah. Was, but I was, yeah, anyways. All right. Every time I use a sports reference, he buys me a fancy cocktail. <laughs> it was very easy for me to incorporate back into like bachelor life at that point. So I'd go hang out with my friends. I would stay the night at their house. We would, you know, have fun, whatever, stay up late. And it was interesting because I feel like, so now Liz and I have been married for five years um, and she went, um, she was in Ethiopia in January for like four weeks. And this was, this year has probably been the first year where, uh, me. where, no, <laughs> come on, that's ridiculous. But, um, so this was the first year that probably when she was gone and I would try to go spend time with like my single guy friends that I kind of felt like an imposter a little bit. Um, it, it's interesting because like the like ultimately as as a married man and Liz and I have really been intentional about making sure that we build community into our marriage. So there's the two of us and we're very much like the center of each other's um, of our relational lives. But we've done we've been really intentional about building um, community around that. Mm-hmm there's still a difference between being a married person and being single because you have, so yeah, there's this difference. There's the, I would say one of the greatest differences between being married and being single is your decision-making process changes so dramatically because every decision we make has to be filtered through another mm-hmm. uh, as a married person versus when you're single, it's like, is do I want to do this? Does it make me happy? Is it, you know, those are kind of the the decisions that we make. And that can be, those are obviously made in the context of community oftentimes, but a lot of times you're not, um, I think we have this concept of being in community and being submitted to one another. And that's a beautiful picture of um, kind of where marriage takes you as well. 
Um, but in marriage, the, the idea is that like every decision I make is submitted to one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so when Liz is out of the country, all of a sudden it's like, like I have this freedom now to, if I want to go wherever I want after work, I can do that. Like if I want to sit around the house in my leather chair and watch multiple episodes of the wire, like <laughs> I can do that. And, and she doesn't have to know about it. <laughs> oh, doop, doop. You can watch The Wire. She doesn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I would say, like, even now, um, having gone through this for five and a half years, there is still this, like, integration period when Liz comes back. um, And, you know, because it's like now it's for the last four weeks, like, that's been my domain. And she's been traveling. um, And she has, like, her schedule. She can do whatever she wants. And there is this, like, reintegration to marriage, like, still five and a half years into it that you're like, oh, like I can't, why is the house messy now? Because when I'm a home alone, very clean. When Liz gets home, very dirty. Yes, here we go, here we go. <laughs> and you have very different eating patterns too, I know, that you capitalize on when you guys are apart. You want set meals, Ben. She likes to snack all day. Yeah. She's a snacker all day. And I got tuna and popcorn and protein bars in my pocket. <laughs> Um, okay, so then what's kind of been your strategy? Is it more of just like there's not a strategy, it's just more of a recognition that this is going to happen? You get what do we what? Sorry. Wow. Yeah, this is so slow on the uptake. We may have to redo this so, whole thing. <laughs> sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake. So it would be like the first couple times we were like coming back together was like way harder than we anticipated, but we didn't really put the pieces together of like, Oh, there's this like reintegration period and we should come to expect this. And I think now that it's expected of like, Hey, cause also there's this added pressure, right? Of like, you just got home from being away for so long and like, it should just be all like rainbows and unicorns and you just want to rip each other's clothes off every second and like, Oh, we're back together. And, la, 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 la. and there's, you know, there's definitely a part of that, but then it gets mixed in with like, Oh my gosh, why are you doing things that way? Or like, yeah. ah, I'm used to, you know, being able to kind of do my own thing or make decisions without having to talk to anybody about it. And so now I think that we just recognize, like, we we come to expect that we have to give each other some extra grace and space and, like, be a little extra gentle when we're kind of reintegrating. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's helped a lot. You guys are really good at intentional community. And I will say that there are some couples where I'm friends with the wife and the husband just doesn't make me feel included. And I will say that you guys are a couple that makes me feel like I'm legitimately friends with both of you. And so mm-hmm. thank you for that because I know a lot of singles don't have that. Um, and I will be moving in in a couple weeks. Um, so great, good. Are you in the house that we're gonna all move into? Is that what's going yes, on? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's do like partridge. Wait, is it partridge family? No, what's what's the Are you bench? No, what was the family that like all said good night to each other? Swiss Waltons. family Robinson. No, nope, the Waltons. That all family. The- that family that did that really crazy thing. What was that? Oh yeah, they said good night to each other. <laughs> <laughs> You know those people? Oh, really man. You know, I want to be I want to be more like that family. Oh gosh, what was that family? They were on that one show. They um they ate breakfast in the morning. <laughs> what was that family? You know what I'm talking about. It was so crazy. They ate breakfast. <laughs> I'm waiting for the punchline. There is none. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Okay. <clears throat> we'll work on your joke delivery soon. Um, but I wasn't planning on this, but why don't you tell everybody how great of a friend I am? Um, no, that, <laughs> that I love that conversation. The only reason I feel free to bring this up is because I think that you, uh, you wrote about it on your Facebook wall, so you were public about it. But I think there's a lot of unmarried people that I know that feel like they can't speak into their married friends' lives. And obviously, I don't think anybody should really speak into people's lives unsolicited. But you had come to me, you and Ben. It was after one of these being apart for a long time. You'd gotten into a bit of a conflict. You were being a bit dramatic. And tell the story because it makes me look good. (laughs) No, it's more so to just show that, like, unmarried people can't speak into married people's lives. Yeah. Well, I think kind of how it went down is I came over and I was ranting and raving about Ben and how awful he was being and how horrible of a life that I have. (laughs) And I feel like the thing that you do really well is you let me go and listen to it because I think what's not helpful is when people don't 
understand frustration at all, you know, and like not giving people a space to actually feel true feelings. But then at the end of it, you kind of called me into something higher and you were like, I kind of, I, I've come to you enough times in our relationship and said, Hey, like our friendship is one where I want you to be able to speak in and make me like, I want to be a better person. And I want you to push me towards that. And in the moments where I'm clearly not on the right track, you calling me out of that and saying like, Hey, I understand that you're frustrated, but like maybe in this case, be the bigger person, call your husband, start to reconcile. And those are definitely not the thing that you want to hear. Like what you want in the moment, it, your what your flesh wants is a friend who's going to be like, yeah, he's such a douchebag. Let's yeah. go get drinks. Yeah. <laughs> but not like that. Because <laughs> that's totally how I talk. No, but I think that's an important thing for, for married people to know that it honors your unmarried friends for you to even voice that you welcome that feedback. And then I think that's also a testament to how you guys do treat your unmarried friends um, because they feel a relationship with both of you. So I know Ben's single guy friends would stand up for you, Liz, because they love you, because they have a relationship yeah. with you. And because I love Ben and I know him and I'm in a relationship with him, I, he's not some distant guy that I never see. I, I know him. I know his character. And so I want to fight for both of you. And that's why I think it is really healthy for couples to invite unmarried people into their lives and for not to not be weird around the opposite sex. Ben gives I me full do. frontal hugs, and I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, we're past that side hug crap. I think, too, it's important of, like, the only reason that I, I truly do feel freedom, when I'm really upset with Ben, I can be a totally 100% honest with you about it, because I know that you know Ben, and that you know that he's a good man, and that he loves me. And I think sometimes when our lives aren't totally integrated, when stuff is hard, we almost... I think sometimes don't talk to people about it because we feel like we need to like protect the image of our spouse or something. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I know that there, I mean, unless I, unless I came to you and said something that just totally like shattered your view of who Ben is, that totally surprised you of like, I could, I could air a lot of frustrations and know that because you're in life with us and that you see us in a day to day basis and that you know, Ben, and you know that Ben loves you and you love Ben, that I have this freedom to say like, okay, we get that we all love each other, but oh my gosh, this is so annoying to yeah, me. Yeah. In a way that like I'm not worried about protecting your like view of him and you know, making sure that you think that he's like perfect and we have this like perfect little marriage where we're always happy. Yeah. And there's a lot of freedom in that and being able to do like I know I can literally and this did happen, literally banged my head up against your living room wall because I was so frustrated <laughs> and not feel like I'm gonna leave and Joy's gonna be like, Oh my gosh, they're headed for the big D. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because mostly because I knew you just needed to get some food in your belly. <laughs> I was hangry. hangry. I was real hangry. Uh, okay. Well, the last thing that I want to address, and thank you for so much for sticking through all the technological failures, but um, I am going to be embedding in this post as well the talk that you gave at Plywood Presents, which um, I have said before, I, it. I love, love, love watching public speakers because I think it's one of the most beautiful art forms. Um, rarely do I find myself, like I always want to learn from everybody, but rarely have I, actually I don't think I've ever heard a talk where I physically was like, I wish I had given that talk. And I, wa I got so passionate about your passion that I really wanted to stand up and flip over the table and do something to like mark that moment because it was so good. And I get so angry that you can remember statistics and then you can just like, she can use PowerPoint, Ben. I can't use PowerPoint. I don't know. I tried at Plywood Present and it didn't work. It was the first time. Seventh grade was a tough one for you. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All the homeschooling. Are you still doing the typing that flies in? <laughs> The what? I don't even Did know that. Do the, the typewriter letters that tick, 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 tick. Is this public school talk? Yeah. I don't even You'll know. Get it. It's a PowerPoint it's right. joke. It's, yeah, it's, all right. it's a PowerPoint. I literally don't even, I, I don't use it because I don't know how to work it. I don't. Um, literally, when I say I used PowerPoint at Plywood Presents, it was that I had sent them some <laughs> photos and I just wanted to use the clicker. I never opened PowerPoint. Anyways, you gave this talk that I think is so powerful because um, I talk so much about, um, I think that we, we do live in a culture that doesn't understand how powerful women's words to men are. And I always talk about, like, women, you don't realize how sensitive men can actually be because I do think, as you addressed in your talk, like, men have had influence. Men are the leaders in our culture. They are the people that have, are in the spheres of influence. But with that... 
um, we sometimes see them as strong and then we don't see that they can actually be um, empowered or cut down by our words. And I think yeah. we've seen so much abuse and we've seen so many men do horrible things that when we stand up for women like you're doing with Seiko, it's easy to then demonize men and only talk to women and to get this, you know, rallying of the female troops. But you and Ben are on this mission to actually raise up men. And you spoke with such powerful, and I would call it respect language. Um, you used words that were not cutting down on a specific gender, but you were building both genders up. And, and you also, something that I thought was really powerful, you talked about how um, you're like, I don't want to use, or I was going to try to do this whole talk because you were speaking to a room of Southern people. And you were like, I don't, I almost tried to make this whole talk without using the word feminism because I felt like then you would, you, I'd get more of a listening ear, but you were like, but that, that downplays how smart I actually think you all are. And this talk is beautiful because you break down what feminism is and what, what it isn't. And there's so many different definitions. Like I was studying feminism a few years ago and there's just literally, there's like a bazillion different types of feminists you can be. Then there's all the different waves of feminism and whatever. I would like to hear, I want everybody to watch the talk that I embed, but I would like to hear from Ben because you talk about Ben and some of his male friends who are stepping up to the plate on this. I would like Ben to just share quickly how you define feminism and why you think this is so important for our generation of men to understand and be open to. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, and Liz and I have had this conversation, like I would say um, even today, um, like, and just to be completely honest and frank, like, I have a hard time, like, feminism is such a loaded word, mm -hmm. right? It has so much weight, it has so much baggage that, um, you know, I don't necessarily, like, even today, like, I still don't, like, first and foremost think of myself as a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if, if the term and if the word can be branded and be remessaged in a way that we probably believe in it, um, that would be where men um, and women are held in an equal light. And the truth is, like, why that – it's kind of crazy that that has to be a, a brand of feminism, that mm -hmm. we're saying equality is feminism, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the picture of how far we have to go um, because it's not even, you know, I, I, what – and I think Liz does this beautifully and she's done it, um, and it's, it's such an empowering thing to be a partner with her. And in the context of saying – it's not about raising women above men. It's about how do we bring um, bring an equal playing field, and how do we make sure that men aren't left behind in the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, but what we as men have to recognize is we do the way that our culture is set up and is in, is is moving. We just have to be honest about it. Um, and the truth is that because I'm a man, it's expected that I'm a leader. It's expected I'm a leader in our relationship. It's expected that I will be a leader in my business, um, in my community and all those kinds of things in my church, um, that those roles, um, for so long have been put in male in men's hands. And <clears throat> I think specifically like to bring it into the conversation around church and around, um, kind of where the, the, um, kind of body of believers are going. Like we have to recognize that women's voices haven't been heard for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe fully that the Lord is speaking through Liz, um, just as much as me. Mm -hmm. And I think without, without like raising up and kind of saying like being willing as a man to bring women into the conversation, like we're going to miss out on huge things. Totally. Uh, so, yeah, no. And I think, um, that I really would challenge all women, um, whether you define yourself as a feminist feminist or not to watch Liz's talk because I think she really um, she gives verbiage on how to have this conversation well and I would just I don't think I make huge requests often but I would ask all men to listen because it, it really really is I've sent this to my whole family and I think you know I mean it, it's just if you grew up with a good dad um, then you don't realize like some of the misconceptions that are out there. And I would say that my father has always surrounded himself with women who lead, with women who are strong. That's why I do what I do. And Liz, you talked about that. Like there's so many things you've been able to do because you have men in your life, like Ben, who believe in you. And, and there's so much that can be unleashed 
when there's men who actually will step up to the plate. And, and one of the points that you make in your talk is about you know, guys going, well, I'm not those guys that do the abuse, that do all these things. But there's truly a role to step beyond just saying, well, I'm not one of those. Because there are so many good men, and you're saying, we need you. So this, this talk is not just for men to inform themselves. It's actually giving you a role of something you can do for your daughters. Like when, Whenever my mom puts things um, in perspective of sons or daughters at the Love and Respect Conference, that's when people shift. You know, it's one thing to be upset with your spouse or whatever. But when you think about how someone's going to treat your daughter someday or your son someday, that's when things get put in perspective. And I saw at Plywood just fathers coming up to you and wanting to talk and wanting to know what they could do because they had never heard it in this way. And you just so eloquently spoke to men in a way that I felt like was disarming, full of respect and motivational and empowering for men. So anyways, I love you guys. I respect you guys. Um, I'm so proud of all the work that you're doing. And thank you for chatting with everybody about your marriage and your work and good feminism. Peace. Peace. Good job, Bite Angles. Love you, Joe.